I'm John Alterman. I'm Senior Vice President, the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and the Director of the Middle East Program. I am really delighted to welcome you to this event today to mark the publication of this book, Independence Movements and Their Aftermath. Uh, just a, a brief security note. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a security incident, but if there are, we'll move to the back of the, the room. We'll presumably we'll go toward the front door. If not, we can go to the other side, and I will tell you what to do if there is a problem. Uh, today, as I said, marks the publication of this book on self-determination movements. I'm especially grateful to the CSS trustee, Fred Khosravi, and to the Brzezinski Institute here at CSIS for both inspiring the project, providing funding for the project, and then frankly getting out of the way and letting us do the project. I'm also grateful to a really spectacular advisory board that we brought in that had experience on independence movements around the world. Uh, to our chapter authors, not only Terrence Lyons, I saw Daniel Serwer hiding in the back. Uh, it's really a pleasure to work with people both on the individual experiences and then also learning lessons from them. Also, uh, my co-conspirator in this project, uh, Will Todman from the Middle East Program, uh, did a tremendous amount of work and was a delight to work with. The project started from the premise that self-determination movements aren't uncommon. Independence is relatively rare. And when it happens, the results of independence movements aren't always happy. We found a lot of literature that looked at, at when groups are able to gain independence and what led to them being able to have independence. We saw a lot of literature about fragile states. We didn't really see very much that tried to bridge those two instances from when you have an aspiring state to transition through accomplishing independence and achieving some sort of success, which however you want to define it, we think is about resilience and economic and political viability as states. Uh, we took two different approaches to looking at this problem. One was to look at a series of case studies. We had five case studies, uh, Bangladesh, Eritrea, Timor-Leste, Kosovo, and South Sudan. We also had a chapter that looked at Balkan efforts in the, the, in, uh, the post uh, Yugoslavia experience to try to create different kinds of autonomy movements. We also took a more quantitative approach. We looked at 70 examples of states that got independence after 1960 to try to see what we could learn from that. And we found that the first approach, trying to look at case studies, was probably a more effective way to do this than a broad quantitative approach. And drawing from those experiences, we devised a policy tool that was meant to be both descriptive and prescriptive. That is, we thought deeply about the different characteristics of an aspiring or nascent state that contribute to success. We established some questions that allow you to do a scoring, and we created a graphic representation that portrayed both how those groups were doing overall and to what areas and issues they should evoke additional attention. Um, the tool is described in chapter nine of the book. That's what it looks like. It's also on the handouts you have. Uh, a more narrative description of the components that feed into the tool are in the policy brief that we've circulated and are also contained in the conclusion to the book. You can purchase the book, which I'd love you to do, or you can download the chapters at no charge from our website at www.csis.org. It's our hope that these materials will be helpful not only to US government officials, but also to foreign government officials and to people within the aspiring independent states themselves. One of the clear findings of this study is that independence often comes in response to unexpected events, but groups can and do prepare themselves for when opportunities present themselves. <coughs> to discuss this basket of issues, we have what is to me a completely delightful, and I think to all of you, a quite remarkable panel. Dr. Denise Natali is the Assistant Secretary of State for Conflict and Stabilization Operations. I first met her more than 20 years ago when she was introduced to me as one of the best experts on Iraqi Kurdistan that I would ever meet. She's had a long and distinguished record in the intervening years working in Iraqi Kurdistan, the Institute for National Security Studies at the National Defense University. The Senate confirmed her in her current job on October 11th, 2018. 20 years sounds like a long time to know somebody, 
But I've known Peter Galbraith for more than 30 years from when he was an energetic young staffer <clears throat> on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and I was working for Senator Moynihan. Then he wrote a very important paper about Saddam Hussein's gassing of the Kurds. He went on to become the first US ambassador to Croatia where he helped negotiate the end of the war for Croatian independence in the early 2000s. He led the Timor-Leste team in negotiations with Australia over oil rights in the Timor Sea. He's remained active in the Kurdish region of Iraq, advising the PUK and the KDP. That gives him personal and direct experience with three of our five case studies. Terence Lyons comes to us with deep experience on fragile states in Africa. He wrote the superb Eritrea case study in our volume, and he's the author or co-author of five books and the editor of four more. He's Associate Professor of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason University, where he's director of the doctoral program and the co-chair of the project on contentious politics. What we're going to do is Denise will give some opening remarks. Uh, then we will have a discussion amongst ourselves. I think there's going to be a lot to discuss. And then we will kick it over to you for further discussion. So it is my special pleasure to introduce my old friend, Assistant Secretary, Dr. Denise Natelli. Good morning. Are we on? Yes. Good morning. I'd like to thank the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, John Alterman in particular. It's really great to, to be back here and to be part of this very important event. Today I'd like to address the critical issue of self-determination and, and specifically the issue of state fragility, the concomitant demands for state sovereignty and other calls for self-determination. Let me be clear. This administration has clearly stated that it respects the territorial integrity of states and it supports state sovereignty as a way to promote global peace and security. This administration has said time and time again, we do not nation build. It is up to every person in every country to determine their own future. At the UN General Assembly in this September 2018, President Trump stated, around the world, responsible nations must defend against threats to sovereignty, not just from global governance, but also from other new forms of coercion and domination. The president went on to say, ultimately, it's up to the nations of the region to decide what kind of future they want for themselves and for their children. Apart from US policy, there are particular aspects of independence movements that create their own challenges. John has outlined some of these uh, and will in the book, but I'll move forward as well. A University of Pennsylvania study of 2017 found that since 1945, there have been more than 464 self-determination movements in 120 countries. And that does not count decolonization movements, but half of these movements had a specific policy goal of independence. On average, independence movements endure 30 years before they become inactive, and only a handful have achieved their goal of independence since 1945. Many of those, as indicated, have achieved independence during a unique historical moment after the Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union. Others have been a result of violent and often protracted civil wars. Of those in the latter group, as John just indicated, the track record for stable, self-sufficient, independent statehood is not positive. South Sudan, for example, has suffered overwhelming conflict for the entirety of its seven years of existence, which came about after an already devastating civil war. After independence, mass killings, rape, sexual slavery are now rampant because state accountability is nearly non-existent and the impunity is the norm. We must also keep in mind that independence movements have their own internal, regional, and international dynamics and obstacles apart from US policy. These are inherent to the movement itself and they extend beyond the emotional 
an often romanticized sense of nationalism attached to self-determination. One example, and an area of great personal interest to myself, is the Kurdistan region of Iraq. In 2017, as many of you know, the Kurdistan regional government held a non-binding referendum on whether the Kurdistan should declare its independence from Iraq. The overwhelming response, this is over 95%, uh, agreed clearly yes. Other issues, however, pose constraints. The US government did not support that referendum and clearly indicated its views from the outset. According to one of the many State Department press statements on the topic, the US believes in a stable, prosperous, unified, and democratic Iraq. This position remains unchanged. Further, the entire international community, or the large part, as well as key regional actors, opposed the referendum. There was inter insufficient interna internal support, no buy-in from most non-Kurdish Iraqi populations. And the decision to hold the referendum in disputed areas was potentially destabilizing and led to rising tensions in which ISIS and other terrorist groups or regional actors could take advantage of. This leads to one general finding. When a movement seeks external support because internal buy-in is insufficient to attain self-determination and the movement fails to address its own institutional deficiencies, which can include internal divisions within the group itself. We tend to think that these movements are homogenous, and they're not. And there's lack of regional support. Success is rare. Is it important to know as well that self-determination is not just independence? That's one extreme. It comes in many forms. There's decentralized governance structures. There's power and revenue sharing. There's security sector reforms, opportunities for people to participate in the political life of their country. These are more realistic options, and they are considered within the territorial boundaries of states. <coughs> so the real issue becomes, how do we address the conditions of fragility and instability that drive people to seek self-determination in the first place? Why does state fragility and instability matter to US national security interests? Self-determination movements often develop in response to neglectful and undemocratic structures, long-term marginalization, lack of economic opportunity, persecution, exploitation, and sometimes they culminate in mass atrocities. This is what we did see in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. In many cases, independence is seen as the only option facing an unwillingness from the state to negotiate or to engage in good faith reform processes. And the demonstration effect of calling for independence can sometimes ripple to other states affected by similar problems. It's clear that self-determination movements and calls for independence are driven in part by political problems. And many studies confirm that political problems are the root of state fragility. Fragility and instability directly threaten US national security. They enable the growth of radical extremism. They incubate transnational organized crime. They stifle economic growth, allow for the spread of pandemic disease, and they prompt destabilizing migration flows. Instability and fragility have costly and lingering impacts on US economic priorities, security cooperation, and the safety and prosperity of the American people. Other institutions, thankfully, and experts have come to similar conclusions. The United States Institute of Peace, recently, its task force, recently launched its report on violent extremism. The bipartisan bills on global fragility introduced in both the House and the Senate. Numerous discussions about fragility and conflict prevention at think tanks such as CSIS, including a recent speech by the State Department's Director of Strategic Planning, Dr. Kyron Skinner, who was here at CSIS, and who outlined the Trump administration's strategic approach to fragile states. What is this new approach? Qu quoting Dr. Skinner, this strategic approach provides us with clear direction. To secure our interests, the United States will marshal our resources and personnel to prevent as well as to mitigate conflict. 
a conflict mitigated costs far more in lives and treasure than a conflict avoided. It also enables the US to judiciously use our resources. Investing on the front end of instability can prevent the need for kinetic action on the back end. This approach, our new approach, is laid out in the 2018 Stabilization Assistance Review, which sets clear requisites for US assistance moving forward. This is also tied to a larger effort by this administration and the State Department to align our foreign assistance, to realign, so that all of our funds that we're spending overseas are linked to our national security priorities in a much more disciplined and targeted manner. This means burden sharing. It means holding our local partners accountable. Local authorities must be at the forefront of solving their own problems. This also means that our engagement, wherever we are, is tied to clear political outcomes. We must show clear measurable impact to assure effectiveness and the judicious use of our US resources. The national security strategy states this approach most plainly. The United States and its partners have opportunities to work with countries to help them realize their potential as prosperous and sovereign states that are accountable to their people. This is where my bureau, the, the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, fills this gap. Our mission is to anticipate, prevent, and respond to conflict that undermine US national interests. We do so in two distinct ways. One is to advance data-driven analytics, and the other is for deploying our team out to conflict zones. Our objective is to inform US policy, strategy, and programs on conflict prevention and stabilization. We do this in three specific ways. We look at security sector stabilization, we track political instability, and we work on programs encountering violent extremism. I just recently, a few days now, a week, returned from Niger, and I went out to the border town of Difa, which is on the southeastern border of Nigeria. And this is the epicenter of Boko Haram in ISIS West Africa. CSO, CSO is working on a program and leading a program on getting these defectors. How do you get Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa people to defect and to reintegrate into their societies? We work in other places as well with the purpose of trying to get armed actors that are not under the control of the state and that threaten sovereignty and the stability of the state. In terms of conflict prevention, CSS, CSO is soon to launch our new instability monitoring and analysis platform. We call this IMAP, which is a four screen, looks like an operations center, uh, but that will track and provide early warning of conflicts on the horizon in real time. This will be available to everyone at the State Department to enable our policymakers to make decisions based on evidence based analysis. CSO also works closely with USAID and DOD to assure that our division of labor is clear. State Department's at the lead, USAID is a lead implementer of non-security assistance, and DOD has a supporting role. It is vital that we avoid the duplication of efforts and we remain accountable for our outcomes and our resources spent. Where we cannot show measurable impact, we cannot continue to provide support. The critical question then is how do we address core fragility risks that drive self-determination. United States diplomacy and assistant efforts can best address fragility when undertaken with principles reflected in the Stabilization Assistance Review. Clear and realistic political goals, a division of labor, burden sharing among our local and international partners, programs and policies based on achievable data-driven benchmarks. Without these best practices, our efforts have the potential to doing the opposite. Large quantities of uncoordinated money and interventions do not guarantee success. We will move forward with these best practices in mind and with the robust interaction from our partners in the academic, non-governmental, and practitioner community. We welcome analyses like this book to provide thought-provoking insights and new perspectives. And I hope that today's event brings new and creative ideas to our important work so that we can devise effective strategies, policies, and programs to support state sovereignty and enduring stability. Thank you.
Denise, thank you very much for those very thoughtful comments. Uh, I interpreted the thrust to be that, that, that as we scan the horizon now, there are no circumstances where our preferred outcome for any separatist movement now is separation. That is, while the US government supported separation in different circumstances in the past, as we look at the current, the current map, we're not seeing any place where we think that's the best option. Is that, uh, is that accurate? Thanks, John. I would say, again, that the United States supports the sovereignty of states. If an entity within a subnational group wants to negotiate on their own, that is the opportunity and that it's their uh, responsibility. It is not for the United States to encourage or to initiate these types of movements. Peter, you have been in the midst of a whole series of these movements. You've had global experience. Does that sound like the, the right position that we shouldn't encourage or discourage, but we should hold back? It's been the pretty consistent policy of the United States to support the existence of every country that exists on the map at the time it exists on the map. So the Nixon administration was deeply committed to the unity of Pakistan at the time of the independence of Bangladesh. Uh, the Bush uh, senior administration was deeply committed to the continuation of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. You may remember, John, that uh, on August 1st, 1st 1991, uh, President George H.W. Bush went to Kiev to warn the uh, Ukrainians against independence. Uh, and by the end of the month, they had declared sovereignty and uh, independence. It's known as the Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, they, on the 21st of June, 1991, James Baker went to uh, 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 Belgrade to warn against the independence of uh, Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, and on the 25th, <coughs> Croatia and Slovenia declared themselves independent. Uh, so this is a, what, what is articulated as the Trump administration policy is pretty consistent. And it ignore, it, this, this policy basically ignores reality. And I think that the fundamental issue is that where you have a group in a geographically defined area that overwhelmingly wants independence, you cannot forever prevent the independence. So of course, the, you could keep the, through brute force, you could keep Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia in the Soviet Union. But once the, and, and incidentally, if you talk to people from those countries uh, who were in the Soviet system in 1970, they wouldn't talk about independence. Once the lid was lifted, those countries move for independence. The same thing was true in Yugoslavia. And what I would argue, because this is the case that uh, Denise has raised, is absolutely true for Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, incidentally, it was a binding referendum. It has, the results has, haven't been implemented, but if you look at what was put in the Kurdistan law, look at what President Barzani wrote in the uh, Washington Post, binding, but the date of implementation hasn't taken place. But I feel pretty confident that sooner or later, there will be an occasion and Kurdistan will become independent. 93%, it's pretty good buy-in. Uh, in an election, I, I was there, I observed it. Huge turnout, everybody wearing, you know, coming in their best clothes. People would tell me, well, we've waited a century for this moment. And that, I think, should get to the next argument. Are independence movements destabilizing? That's the view in Washington. Again, nothing new about the Trump administration's approach. But I would argue to you that sometimes holding countries together is destabilizing. Iraq's a case in point. Is this anybody's idea in the 100 years of its existence of a stable country? It was, held, it was created uh, in an artificial way, basically held together by brute force that ultimately, in the case of Kurdistan, culminated in genocide but also the brutal repression of the Shiites. And are we surprised that it's broken up the way it has? Um, and then, the, the, and, and is the outcome of independence inherently destabilizing? Let's take a word in the English language that has a terrible connotation, balkanization. What does it mean? I mean it's a process, of course, that began when the Balkans were 
uh, and the Ottoman Empire, one, one state, if you will, and then uh, divided among the Ottoman Empire and Austria-Hungary, and, and so it went. Uh, and you know, the idea was sort of the breakup of places. That's a source of instability. But today, the Balkans are relatively stable as compared to their previous history. Why? Because they've balkanized. There isn't much else left to break up. And in fact, to some degree, they're, they're coming together. Uh, when I was in, uh, uh, and, and this is actually another point, once people achieve independence, they often tend to then come back together. Uh, Slovenia is a case in point. I remember visiting it in 1991, just after independence. Got to the border, and you know, normally when you enter the border, cross the border of these communist countries, it's pretty strictly controlled. They'd want to, uh, you couldn't take pictures. They insisted I take pictures of the Slovenian flag. They wanted to stamp my passport, but it was an official passport, so I couldn't let them do it. The first thing they did after declaring independence was to get rid of the Yugoslav license plates, which had a red star on it. They put the Slovenian symbol on it. I went to Ljubljana, the finance minister gave me the new currency, he autographed it. <laughs> 15 years later, you go to that border, well there isn't a border, it's all part of Schengen. The flag, yeah, the Slovenian flag's there, so is the EU flag. License plates, the now the EU symbol. Currency, the euro. Um, so, it, 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 and this actually goes to one other point which is independence and globalization go hand in hand. We tend to think of them as contrary forces. But it is, in fact, the existence of global norms, global institutions, like the European Union, that makes possible independence of places like, uh, now, like, the, uh, like the seven countries to emerge from the former Yugoslavia. Not that they immediately entered the EU, although two now have. It is that the norms that existed uh, uh, were there. And, and a, a final point, just to reflect on uh, is the independence movements are, uh, with, with perhaps the exception of Quebec, uh, a phenomena of the Eastern Hemisphere, not the Western Hemisphere. And it goes to the nature of how states are defined. In all the Western Hemisphere states, we define nationality by geography. You're an American because you're here and you've become an, an American citizen. That's true if you, and we, we're very proud of that, that's true if you're an Argentine, after all the largest ethnic group in Argentina is not Spanish, it's Italian. And we don't, we don't say we speak American, Argentines don't stay, say they speak uh, uh, Argentine, they speak Spanish. But you go uh, in, in the Eastern Hemisphere, ethnicity and nationality so often goes together. So imagine you're in a country which defines itself in a way that doesn't include you. <coughs> You're a Kurd in Iraq, Iraq, which defines itself as an Arab country. How can you ever feel this is truly your country? And that is at the root of, of so many of these independence movements. Uh, or take Pakistan, um, where one group, the Punjabis, is basically dominant. And hence, you, you have residual independence on the part of the, well, quite strong on the part of the Baluch, and you know, uh, intermittently on the, on the part of the, the Sindhis. So I think this is a, this is a phenomenon we, we may wish didn't exist. It is going to exist sooner or later. I believe all these places will become independent uh, that wish it, if they wish it overwhelmingly. And it's not, in, in, and it probably is going to make the world more stable rather than less stable. Thank you. Terrence, in, in Ethiopia in particular, you had the, the independence of Eritrea, which Seems to be going well, seems to be going poorly, seems to be going well again. You have other independence movements within Ethiopia now. Right. So Eritrea only seemed to be the beginning. How, how does this question play out in that environment? Uh, is, is Peter right that we should just keep letting it? I, the, the way I would put it is I think uh, Ambassador Galbraith has the question right. I'm not sure I would agree with the answer in the Horn of Africa, uh, because context in these things matters so much. Uh, that I do think the question is, uh, do independence movements have the possibility to lead to more or less stability? It, 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 my answer to that was be, it depends. In the Eritrean case, I don't think there's a very convincing argument to be made that the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia could have ended in any way other than 
Eritrea and Eritreans getting their much desired independence. The Eritrean People's Liberation Front had fought for decades, had suffered for decades. The martyrs <laughs> who uh, are seen as these sort of one of the, the forces in the contemporary political culture of Eritrea could not be denied that. I was there during the Eritrean referendum in 1993, and more than Kurdistan, they got 99.8% in a UN-sponsored uh, referendum. So they got their independence, first of all, because the old-fashioned way, they fought and defeated the other side and won it. Second of all, the, uh, the rest of Ethiopia, which was simultaneously going through a transition, was supportive of them getting their independence. Uh, uh, Mela Sanawi, then uh, the leader of Ethiopia, supported the referendum. In fact, a lot of Eritreans in Ethiopia voted for the separation uh, a referendum. Um, and so it depends. Now, to go a bit beyond my, my Eritrea case, in Eritrea, the uh, uh, Eritrean People's Liberation Front was a victorious insurgent movement. So when it won its independence, it was a very powerful, hierarchical, cohesive, authoritarian government because that's how they were when they fought the war. I mean, the, the legacies of winning the war shape how post-war uh, governance takes place. In South Sudan, which I also don't think that war would have ended without the independence of the South Sudan, they would, they would continue to fight until they had what they so uh, dearly held, uh, and for some very good reasons. But the uh, SPLM, the Sudan, South Sudan Liberation Movement, was nothing like the EPLF. It was always a hodgepodge and agglomeration, and you see that in how South Sudan is governed today. Somaliland has been relatively stable, governs itself, is ignored largely, and in some ways for good reason, I mean, not for good reason, but has had the impact of uh, the non-interference in Somaliland, the northern part of Somalia, has probably been good for Somaliland uh, stability. Now, in your question of other parts of Ethiopia, for a long, long time, there were struggles uh, of the Oromo. The Oromo people in Ethiopia struggling for self-determination. There was a group, the Oromo Liberation Front, which still exists. But then when the internal politics shifted and the Oromo became the leaders of the ruling party, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, that calculation was decentered, was, 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 was uh, uh, destabilized in the sense that the Oromo had to think through we thought we would always be marginalized citizens, but now the prime minister is an Oromo, so maybe there are other options. The OLF has returned, left Asmara, Eritrea, and then returned to Ethiopia. And so the, uh, the, it's not static that once you want independence, you're always going to want independence, but once you want independence, something fairly dramatic that empowers you is going to have to replace that so that you feel you have a stake in the, in the uh, remaining within the sovereign, uh, the sovereign entity. Let me make one other response with regard to sovereignty and the U.S. Uh, foreign policy, because it, it's it's a bit not ironic, but it's a bit uh, uh, telling, perhaps, when you think of Eritrea and the question of sovereignty. The, Eritrea va uh, values sovereignty over all else, every sacred inch of the land. They've had fights with most of their neighbors because they're hyper-sovereign. They're hyper-concerned about their sovereignty because they fought and suffered so much to get it and because they live in a very rough neighborhood and do have neighbors who don't wish them well. And so sovereignty and a newly independent state, I think, can often go together, that you'll get more <coughs> states that have a large, greater concern over their sovereignty because they are new, because they haven't yet. They got, a, they got a chip on their shoulder. Every time somebody does the slightest thing on the border, they're like, you can't do that, we're independent. Uh, and so you can get that kind of a reaction uh, from uh, an independence movement, not, not just a diminution of sovereignty and therefore a diminution of international order. Well, one of the interesting things in your chapter, is, which I found fascinating, was that, uh, and it was validated in some of the other work, having a war doesn't actually make you less likely to have a sort of successful movement. There are ways, as you suggested, that a war can bring people together, yeah. can consolidate a movement, can make a state yeah. in a way that a more peaceful negotiation might not. Right. Well, there, there's an you know, old political science theory about war-making states, right. but it is it, a, 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 a battle-hardened group is a hard group, right? I mean, it's hard politically, it's disciplined, it's often very violent. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a nice group necessarily, but it is a strong, 
uh, cohesive group and can lead to a very strong authoritarian outcome. So if you want democracy, it might not be desirable, but if what you want is a stable international system, a, a victorious insurgent group can give you that. Uh, one of the challenges we have to, to consider is whether we overestimate the, the happiness that comes from separation. Uh, Albert Hirschman, the economist, used to talk about the hiding hand that if we actually knew how much uh, economic development projects would cost, we wouldn't do a lot of things that end up being really helpful. So it's good that we don't actually know. Doing some uh, evaluations of that work many decades later, economists found that actually we didn't, the, the real problem is we overestimate the benefits. Nobody ever overestimates the benefits that come from things. You tend to overestimate the cause. Do you think that, that there's a, a systematic way in which independence movements overpromise and underdeliver, and what does that mean for the U.S. government interested in issues of stability? Certainly, thanks. Um, I do think, I, I'll say geopolitics is tantamount. So I, I do think systematically you can look at and say, first of all, what do we mean by success? I think many of us in the room could say stability, being able to self-sustain, to provide for your people, local governance that's cohesive, and, and those types of governance issues. So I would say geography matters, and you mentioned this in your book. Do you have internal buy-in? Do you have regional buy-in? So at the end of the day, this is why I, I, I I try to make that distinction between there is U.S. policy and then there's the realities on the ground that go beyond the sentiments of nationalism, self-determination. Because it's a very, you know, this is, a, this is an issue that people can re identify with, respond to emotionally, but at the end of the day, can people be able to access revenues, resources, and provide for their people? So geopolitics matters. Um, you can overestimate the benefits of the emotional part of it right, symbols, this is, this is important, but at the end of the day, that's not what will provide the stability and the security that we, like again, in the United States, we look at these types of issues of how to assure stability. So look beyond the symbols, look beyond the emotions, and what are the realities on the ground that will allow this place to sustain itself so that people on, in the region can live peacefully and prosperously. Prosper in a prosperous way. <laughs> Prosperously. Prosperously. <laughs> I don't want to create a new word. Uh, Peter, you've been deeply involved in negotiations both with, uh, with Kurds and, and with, with folks in, in Timor-Leste over resources that would accrue to these governments uh, after a separation. Denise suggests that, that there's a lot of over-promising when you're in the negotiations with the folks in the governments, both as they talk amongst themselves and as they talk with their negotiating partners, how do they calibrate what they would like, which is a lot, versus what they're going to, what they're likely to get, which is somewhat less than what they'd like? I mean, do you find that they can plan effectively? I'm not, I'm not quite sure that that's a, a, a relevant question. I mean, the, the inter, international law is, is quite clear that the resources in a place go with the place when it becomes independent. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it may be that if you're uh, a place that has a lot of oil, South Sudan, Kurdistan, you might say, am I better off being independent uh, and having all of it or sharing it? Uh, but I, I think, by and large, the, that these factors are, are almost insignificant in the desire for independence, which really has to do with a sense of your own identity uh, as a people, a culture. Again, if you're, you know, you're a Kurd living in an Arab country, you, you know, you, you, your language is not, even though in the Iraqi constitution it's now equal on the Canadian model, it's in practice it really isn't. You know, you really aren't full citizens, and this desire has always been there for the entire history of Iraq. I mean, yes, it's emotional, but 
law of, the, of independence is, is, is a very emotional phenomena. Um, what is also true is that countries that, many of the countries that have become independent have become so much better off. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Croatia, uh, Slovenia, for all the problems, for example, in the for former Yugoslavia, and all the warnings of the disasters that will follow, these countries, uh, say the Croatia and Slovenia, are much better off. Uh, some people argue, well, it's unfair for them to be independent because the others are going to be left behind. But that's a hard argument to make if you're of those people. Why should I, as a Slovene, have to carry everybody else in, in Yugoslavia? Um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, again, you, you can have a, you, you, so these movements sometimes wax and wane. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, the Orono in, in, in Ethiopia. And, you know, and, and that's a fair point. Uh, uh, but there are other movements that are very persistent, very overwhelming. And, that, and those are really the ones that, and, and where there really isn't a sense of reconciliation, again, to come back to the Kurds, they were victims of genocide. I mean, if we were victims of genocide, would we want to live in the country that committed the genocide, no matter how that country reformed itself? Uh, and they don't. I mean, e even if, if I said, sure, I would, you're not going to change their psychology. So at some point, you, you, you have to accept the result and move on, and there, there, there are quite a number of pl places in the world uh, that are like that. Um, but but I, what I would say is I, I do think that economic issues are really not that key to the process. I, I'll give you another example in my ancestral homeland. Uh, if there's a, a hard exit, uh, a hard Brexit, uh, Scotland, which voted two to one to remain in the European Union, and where in its own independence referendum, the argument was if you become independent, you can't stay in the EU. The, there will be a strong argument that even after Brexit, Scotland will be better off remaining in the, uh, uh, in, with, with Britain rather than going its own way. But there will be a strong emotional thing saying the English pulled us out of uh, the European Union against our will, and particularly if there's a severe recession that goes with it. Uh, and this is, this is part of what drives independence. Carrots, where, where, do the, where does the emotional piece come in in the varied African context? Is it relatively consistent the way Peter's described it, that, that there just are these groups that are clearly delineated and, and feel a sense of, of, uh, of difference, or is it more plastic? Yeah, I think there's a couple of, uh, using, again, my Horn of Africa, uh, the cases that I know best, there's, there's a varied answer to that. In some place like South Sudan, a South Sudanese identity was extremely strong when you were being attacked from the north. We were all southerners, and they, the northerners, were attacking us. But then when South Sudan, not surprisingly, when South Sudan got its independence, internal differences became more important. So we're you now a Dinka versus a Nuar, or an Equatorian, where a Dinka became politically salient in a way to mobilize, in a way to make claims on resources and political power. What I would say in the Eritrean case is that the Eritrean identity is they constructed a multi-ethnic identity. Eritrean, the Eritrean state says there's nine ethnicities in Eritrea, and I could probably name seven of them off the top of my head. But there are Afars, and there's Tigrinyas, and the Sahos, and all these other groups. But they became Eritreans through the struggle. It was in the process of resisting the Ethiopian state and what they regarded as illegal, Ethiopian occupation, they argued that their struggle was a self-determination struggle. They were a separate Italian colony that was never allowed independence in the same way that Kenya and Botswana and Nigeria were, or were Senegal. It wasn't fair, and they had those same rights. In Somaliland, the group that took over Somaliland was called the Somali National Movement, it was created as a, as a Somali-wide movement, but particularly drew from a particular clan within Somalia, the Isak clan. And so uh, that's a way that a kind of a, 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 an insurgent group that had a Somali identity when it was launched became more of an Isak uh, identity and therefore uh, favored uh, the independence of Somaliland. My, so my larger point in all of this is that where I might disagree with Ambassador Galbraith, uh, 
is that these groups are often fluid. And are you an Issaac or are you a Somali or are you a Somali lander? Are you a Dinka? Are you a Southern Sudanese? Yes, yes, and yes, depending on the context, depending on the opportunity structures and how you're treated by others. And so it's not that you are you know, you are Southern Sudanese and you always will be because the Southern Sudanese suffered so terribly in the Civil War uh, and, the, and the violence perpetrated against them from Khartoum. When you're in a different context, now in a Southern, uh, a South Sudanese political context, then different identities are salient. Different identities become sources of mobilization. And as you reference, and with the horrific violence in South Sudan, that is, uh, uh, you know, an international crisis of the highest magnitude. If I, if I could just jump in, I, I don't, I'm not arguing that, that this is what's true for every case. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there are cases, you cite Eritrea, East Timor, is an, which is another multi-ethnic place, where uh, the, the shared struggle, the shared identity becomes very strong and is within, you know, some reasonable period of time, a century or whatever, is going to be very fixed. And I would argue that's true of Kurdistan, that's true of Croatia, it's true of Lith Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and it's true of Scotland for centuries, even if it doesn't mean they want independence. Uh, 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 in other cases, you're right, it's more fluid. Uh, and, you know, where it's, a, where it's fluid, where it's passing, one may not give the, the same uh, credence to mm -hmm. an independence movement. And, and I think the other thing we have to be careful about is uh, independence movements that, you know, I would define them as a place where you had a population in a, a distinct population in a geographically defined area that overwhelmingly wants independence. Well, if they got to be the distinct population in the geographically defined area by ethnic cleansing, genocide, mm -hmm. or the Republic of Serbska and Bosnia being a case in point, sorry, no, you don't, you don't get to go that way. And, we, and, and that sort of thing we can't accept. Yeah, just, I'd just like to add, I, I think in all self-determination movements, you, you can't overdeterm the homogeneity of the movement. There's fragmentation in all of these groups. So there's a bit of an essentialism. I, I, you know, when I hear all groups have this one identity that stayed the same because they had this moment in their time, self-determination movements are not homogenous. So you have to deal with, at the same time of getting international recognition, regional support, the internal cohesiveness also affects the dynamics of the movement, apart from anything else. So moving beyond essentialism or primordialism uh, help, to me, would be a better tracker of what the realist and, outcomes and, and would And does be. the US government, in your view, have an interest in trying to, to make these movements more heterogeneous and more accommodative of multiple identities that people can trade off on? As I said, the U.S. policy is to support the territorial integrity of states. At the same time, if this is an internal matter. If parties internally ha were in the process of having an agreement amongst themselves, whether that be a, an agreement to, to go their different ways that was mutually acceptable, it's generally not going to stand in the way of that either. But that's the decision, as I said in the beginning, and what the administration says. It's up to the people to decide locally that what their future is. So that is something that we're not going to engineer, but it would be the decision made between the various parties on the ground. And John, if I could jump in. This is where Denise and I disagree, and it's not just a disagreement with this administration, but with pre previous ones. Yes, the, the policy basically is to support territorial integrity. And I think that's a flaw. I think the policy ought to be to do everything possible to avoid violence. The breakup of Yugoslavia is a case in point. By the time Baker went to, uh, uh, to, to Belgrade, there was not the slightest possibility of avoiding the breakup of, of Yugoslavia. Slovenia and Croatia had, had overwhelming referenda for independence. The two leaders, Tudjman and Kuchan, uh, even if they'd wanted to call it off, they couldn't. And of course, neither of them wanted to call it off. So if he had instead said, whatever you do is your business, but if any of you start a war, we're gonna, we're gonna come down on you. There wouldn't have been a war. I mean, and the United States power at that time was, you know, it's not like today. It was really paramount in the world. Just after Gulf War I, uh, the breakup, or the Soviet Union was about to break up the, the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, and, and that, I think, fundamentally ought to be our message. I, we, we could look at what happened in 2017 after the Kurdistan referendum. 
in which the United States, because it was angry that the Kurds had gone ahead and held the referendum, allowed a Shia militia commanded by a guy who, uh, Abu Mahdi Mohandas, who had actually been convicted of blowing up the US Embassy in Kuwait in 1983, to use American tanks against the Kurds in Kirkuk in an operation that was planned by the Iranians, by Qasem Soleimani. I, I, I mean, it might have been much better to say, Kurds, we don't like what you've done, and certainly we don't like the fact you did this in the uh, disputed areas. But on the other hand, we don't want to see violence. And however this handles it, our, our role is uh, we, there shouldn't be violence, and certainly nobody should be allowed to use US supplied weapons uh, as part of violence either way. Peter, does that sound right? Uh, Terrence, does that sound right to, um, uh, uh, to say that, that our goal is just avoid violence? Well, uh, I, I do think that there's a question of, of, uh, of, of, of timing or time frame. Is there a short-term concern versus a long-term concern? Because if the result of avoiding violence is to come up with a state that's forced to be unified or a state that's, a, or a state that's allowed to fall apart, those are probably not the right words, actually, that the people in the states keep together or the people in the states uh, divide, uh, it's, it's often not clear which of those is going to be the least violent outcome. I, when I, in, in the early 1990s, when I was working on Ethiopia and Eritrea, I'd meet the e e Eritrean people in town all the time, the EPLF guys in town all the time, and I'd say, listen, you guys, you're going to have to settle for autonomy. You're never going to get your independence. Remember, this is the early, this is late 80s, before Yugoslavia and before uh, the Soviet Union. You're never, international community's never going to get it. When are you going to stop fighting in order to accept a deal for autonomy. Jimmy Carter is trying to negotiate this right now. And the EPLF guys looked at me and he said, but we're going to win. You know, and so their, their desire, their commitment to the cause, they were smarter than me, or they understood that they were prepared to sacrifice more than I believed a group would sacrifice, because the sacrifices were uh, extraordinary. So there's two parts of that. One is that it's often very difficult for an external party, like the United States, to figure out which path is going to lead to reducing violence in the long run. Uh, and then second of all, related, is that an awful lot of this dynamic comes within the, is, is, is within the movements, within the country. It wasn't anybody's choice but the Eritreans to be independent. Uh, you know, that didn't matter what the US thought about that. It didn't matter in the end what Ethiopia thought about that. It didn't matter what the what then Organization of African Unity, now the Africa Union, thought about that because they didn't like it and they were worried about the precedent and so on. When you fight and you defeat the other army and you occupy the territory, you are independent. There was nobody, no way you know, to out, un, undo that. A lot of Ethiopian nationalists say, oh, well, we should never have accepted that. We should have, Melisanawe, the, the Ethiopian uh, leader, should have not allowed that. I said, there's just no way they could have prevented it. The Eritreans controlled that territory with this army that had fought for decades. And to say, I wish it away, wasn't going to be very helpful for reducing, uh, uh, reducing conflict. So before I go to the audience, let me, let me ask that question about great power mm -hmm. engagement. Because certainly what we've seen in, in Timor-Leste is the United States came around and, and really invested to make this work. In the Balkans, we sent some of our best diplomats <laughs> to make stuff work. I mean, there have been instances where the US invested along with allies in making these places work. And as Peter suggested with, uh, with the Iraqi Kurdish referendum, uh, the US was staunchly opposed. Uh, is there a way to make this work if great powers <laughs> don't want it to work? I mean, we're talking about the success of these institutions. Is some sort of great power embrace, endorsement, acquiescence necessary to, to get success? Or can you do it without it? As maybe, maybe, maybe Eritrea is a, a skew case. Or Ethiopia is the great power in that case. How, how do we think about that? How, how, how important are you in all this? 
<laughs> I can't speak to previous administrations and what previous policy was on engaging or actively engaging and encouraging. And I look at the breakup of the Soviet Union and the countries that, and the states that emerged from that as a very distinctly different uh, cases than what we look at today in, in places like Iraq or in places like what happened in South Sudan. So I can't speak to the past, but I, I will keep, continue to affirm that. And when I said in my presentation, yes, you do have U.S. policy. We're very clear. Ambassador Galbraith has indicated this. Some of the changes, some of these statements were made previously about our commitment to the territorial integrity of states. However, the, you can look at the case itself. What are the geopolitical realities? I actually think you can you know, do a checklist. Do you have regional buy-in? I know there's a lot of emphasis on does the United States policy support X. We're clear. On, on, on how we approach this. We don't nation build, uh, we don't get involved in, in the re-engineering of states. But if there is, you know, is there regional buy-in? If you are you a landlocked country and does everyone around you uh, refuse? That, that could be a problem. Is there internal buy-in? Is this a negotiated settlement? Right? In South Sudan, this was not a unilateral move. It was a decision made by both parties. So I, I would have a tendency to look at, yes, you can look at the great power um, support, but equally important, I would probably say in many cases more so. We're, we're talk, looking at this from Washington, D.C., but when you're living on the ground, you have to, you know, how are you getting your revenues and resources and sustaining yourself? So regional buy-in matters, internal buy-in matters. Does the parents, what's your relationship going to be with the parent state? Is it a clean divorce? You know, is it a mutual divorce so that you can then move on and have these things? So that's a very different scenario, right, than saying we just have great power, great power support and so then we can do it. John, if I, I think Denise has a point, uh, but I mean, first, Eritrea is certainly not a, uh, an outlier. East Timor, they continue to struggle for 24 years on an island with zero support from the outside world. Nobody was supportive of them. Well, Portugal at the UN, but no, there was, you know, they, they fought with handmade weapons. Um, the entire world was opposed to the independence of breakup of Croatia and Slovenia. Now, later, the Germans became supportive, but at the time, the Germans were keen, they just had unification, not to alienate Gorbachev. And, and the US was, was very much opposed, partly because it was afraid of what would happen, uh, uh, you know, the model it would set to, for the breakup of the Soviet Union and therefore the loss of, 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 of Gorbachev. So uh, what is also true is that the opportunity also arises because of changes in the attitude of the, of the parent country. So in Indonesia, you had um, uh, Suharto's uh, ouster. You had a rather erratic fellow in President Habibi uh, who made an impulsive statement that you know, if the Timorese could, could uh, have a referendum if they wanted it, and the UN jumped in. Of course, the Timorese, the Indonesians have been telling the world about um, how, much the, how much they'd done in, in East Timor. Uh, and so you know, they, the, the first victim of propaganda is often the propagandists. They believed they'd win the referendum. Little surprise when. They got 80% and they burned the place down on the way out. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, in many ways, the breakup of the Soviet Union was a Russia independence movement. That is Yeltsin uh, taking independence from, uh, from the Soviet Union and, and from Gorbachev. But that really comes back to the point that very often, uh, sooner or later, the parent country gets tired of the, of, of the troublesome uh, 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 member. Uh, so Britain gets tired of the SNP and says you can have a referendum. There are many Iraqis who say, uh, including a body actually, repeatedly up until shortly before the referendum, Prime Minister of Iraq, that you know, if the Kurds want to have a referendum, that's their decision. We hope they'll stay. Because at a certain point, many Iraqis begin to find, you know, the Kurds with their, persist, their total lack of commitment to the country to be troublesome. And so I, you know, th there may be a role at, at some point for the US or, or other countries, uh, because our role in, in the world is increasingly diminished, uh, to come and play a, a, a larger role. Can I, can I make a comment? Can Just yeah, one small, small intervention uh, having to do with the US role. Where, what I think is an exceptional case, perhaps an outlier from this general model, is the South Sudan case. 
The U.S. has its fingerprints all over that peace agreement. The U.S. government at the highest levels, U.S. civil society mobilized around uh, the cause of South Sudan and John Garang, and there was a whole very, very powerful narrative in this town, uh, not, not, in, not in, in correctly in many ways, but that the U.S. was deeply involved in putting pressure on Khartoum to sign that agreement uh, and then to go through with the, uh, the referendum. The referendum looked very touch and go into the last minutes. Uh, you know, uh, Princeton Lyman, who was a special envoy, Ambassador Princeton Lyman, was really, you know, pulling his hair out to the very end, wondering if they, if the cartoon would really accept it. And then once they got their independence, and there was great celebration, and then it began to break down. In my view, the U.S. began to say, oh boy, those, that's not our problem. That's, the South Sudanese aren't behaving very well, are they? We'll give humanitarian assistance, and isn't it terrible, isn't it terrible? And I, and I do think that in that unusual circumstance where the U.S. was deeply involved in the process that led to the independence of South Sudan, that the U.S. hasn't lived up to its responsibilities uh, as it ought to. Can I just make one point, too? I want to go back to where the U.S. It's not a matter of will the U.S. support an independence movement or not. It's what, where we are supporting. So there's different, there's different types of, as we know, self-determination movements. So a, a, a whole area where we are engaged is decentralization of authority. As I indicated, how do we address the, sometimes the conditions of all of this, state fragility? So where, good, where state governance has failed, how can we encourage decentralization so that groups seeking self-determination can have the type of um, local administration or autonomy that they're seeking within the state? It's not either or. How do we encourage revenue sharing and power sharing and resource sharing between these two groups so that there's, not, there's an alternative? And that's where we can make democratic institutions, the rule of law. These are the types of engagements that the United States does commit to in many of these fragile states and that we are continue to, to again, and I keep talking about the preventative component of it. A lot of this is part of where we engage and we will continue to engage. But if I can add, one of the things is once you set up autonomy arrangements, they often become the springboard to, to demands for independence. Mm -hmm. The Scottish no. Assembly, you know, and within 14 years of demand for referendum. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Kurdistan government in regional government in Iraq, which has de facto independence anyhow, uh, both in the constitution and the way it operates, its own army and uh, its own parliament president. Uh, the Iraqi army basically isn't allowed there. But the fact that it has that, that independence uh, has only created a vehicle and institutions for a, an independent country. The, the republics of the former Yugoslavia it was a very decentralized constitution, uh, and, and yet that partly facilitated it. And, and in fact, in many ways, you, and you almost have this as an increasing, something increasingly recognized under international law, for example, the, what the Badenturk Commission determined, that where you have a federal unit, where there's a referendum, and where the result is strong, then the case for independence becomes very, very strong. Thank you. Uh, when we go to the audience, I see a lot of hands. We have microphones coming up from the back. And for the first question, why don't we go to this gentleman in the front? Thank you, Farah. Uh, thank you. Um, a very interesting discussion. My name is Obrad Kasich, and uh, representing a government that's been singled out as, and a people of, as the exception to self-determination on the basis of moralism. I represent the Republic of Srpska in a trade office here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think there are two interesting interlinked questions that come out of this very interesting discussion. First and foremost, th there's a contradiction when you take a moral position, as Peter has, uh, that certain people are disqualified because they've committed ethnic cleansing and genocide, to use his word. Uh, but yet, the same people in this case uh, were ethically cleansed from Croatia, where he was an ambassador and actively supported the ethnic cleansing of the Serbian population. And you have a state which he appears to have no problem with, that it's existence. Uh, where is that moral fine line where you determine who has morally lost the right to their own state? Is it Turks because of what they've done to the Kurds? Is it uh, French because of colonialism, imperialism, the British? Who, when does the state become a moral uh, cost that you pay for your 
ill action or is there a time limit? So if you've done this over the last 20 years, that's fine. But if you did it over the last 100, uh, I know if you did it over the last 100, it's fine. But if you did it over the last 20, it's not good. And your people are disqualified forever from independence and okay. self-determination. It All seems right. to be a very dangerous precedent. And that brings me to a question, uh, not <laughs> as emotional, <laughs> I promise you. Uh, I, I don't see how it's possible to maintain this position of the United States current administration, which is uh, that the states are individually responsible for their future and the people, <coughs> and that the U.S. will not uh, engage one way or the other to determine the future of what they're negotiating over. Uh, what happens when the state decides to use force? For example, in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, if the state decides to use force, what would the U.S. response then? Is it a maintainable position, in other words, to have this kind of uh, hands-off approach? All right, and I want to take a few questions. There's a lot of hands and, uh, and not a lot of time. Behind you, Farah, the, the gentleman, the purple tie. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bashir Goth. I'm the representative of Somaliland in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was reading your book last night on, on page 145. I have seen that you have written Somaliland has theoretically has, has fulfilled all the theoretical standards of statehood. And that's correct, in my opinion. Somaliland has, over, over the last 27 years, been peaceful, stable, and democratic. Actually, we can say a model in the region, and the ambassador will, will I think, verify that one. Uh, it is in a very strategic place which, uh, in, across the Babel Mandeb. Uh, in a volatile region, it's a very peaceful region. It contributes to the stability and peace in the whole region, and I think that's to the interest of the United, of the United States, because it prevents it prevented terrorism and piracy from, its, uh, from the whole region. Don't you think that lack of meaningful engagement will bring instability instead of engaging with money. Okay, thank you. And then there's somebody back there, just right there. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Ahmed, I'm from South Yemen. I'm representing STC. Uh, I heard a gentleman talking about the self-determination cases. I was hoping that, uh, sorry, I have sore throat. I was hoping that to hear uh, the, anyone talking about the case of uh, South Yemen. Uh, South Yemen, uh, as you may know, we never been one country in Yemen. We just united in 1990, and then the, the unity collapsed, and it became an occupation for us in South Yemen. Twice, uh, war against us. Even now, the war is going on. Uh, do you think uh, South Yemen, uh, you can talk about self-determination based on what you talk and hear, gentlemen? Okay, thank, thank you. you. So let's take those three. Sure. So and, and I think I can address a couple of them within the same question. And I'd like to say this is not isolationist, neither hands off. Um, by indicating that the United States supports the territorial integrity of states does not mean, though, that we're not looking at the front end. And I keep going back to the core of fragile states. And it's, this is very important, that I go back to what can we do, what we are committed to doing to prevent some of these reasons for people to ask for self-determination from happening in the first place. So conflict preventative measures whether that be you know, some of the early warning forecasting and types of enabling local partners, burden sharing, working with local partners on the ground so that they are responsible for their own futures and their own political outcomes. So it, it's not a retrenching. It's, it's focusing more on the front part of it and getting at some of the root causes of state fragility in the first place, if that makes sense. Well, let me uh, take the case of Somaliland first. To me, this is open and shut. Of course, it should be recognized as an independent sovereign state. It's operated that way for 27 years. And that's, uh, you know, that, that Somaliland is a perfect example of the kind of absurdity of a policy that is based on the, you know, preserving forever the territorial integrity of a state that actually doesn't exist, that is Somalia within the borders on the map. 
Uh, with regard to uh, South Yemen, um, I, I know the history. I don't know enough, you know, but, but you do have a geographic area. You do have a, a different political history from uh, Sana'a Yemen, uh, maybe particularly acute now. I mean, I would, I would also say if there was a genuine overwhelming support on the part of the people of South Yemen, then that would be their in entitlement. And, and I want to emphasize this isn't, uh, well, yes, there's a moral issue, but the UN Charter is based on moral issues. This is a matter of international law. The UN Charter in the very first article speaks of the right of self-determination of peoples. And there is a, a whole body of international law going back, you know, including the Montevideo Convention in the uh, 1930s, that, that talk about this as a, a, a matter of international law. There are, however, competing principles of international law. There's a genocide convention. And so it's not a moral matter to, to say that if you go out and you massacre the people the, the, who would vote the other way in your territory, you drive them out, you have a Srebrenica, Visegrad, and all these places. Well, maybe then everybody's left doesn't get to vote. I mean, Quebec couldn't just expel all the English speakers and then say, oh, well, now we get to have a referendum on independence. Um, so it, that, that's a, um, a very practical matter. And uh, I won't go into a detailed uh, explanation of US policy toward uh, uh, in Croatia. But I can simply say that we uh, did everything we could to uh, bring about a peaceful settlement within Croatia of the uh, Krajina issue. And we strongly opposed Tujman's effort to, pre uh, uh, to prevent the return of Serbs. And ultimately, as a result of US pressure, significantly, uh, Croatia did restore citizenship, did allow people to reclaim their property. Uh, sadly, only a percentage of them have come back. And I know we could debate this, Mr. Kesic, for many hours, because God knows I have. <laughs> um, Terrence, I assume you don't want to go into the Republic of Skirbsko, but you might want to talk about uh, Somalia. It's a lovely spot. I'd be happy to go into it. <laughs> um, no, I, I do want to say a, a word on Somaliland, though, because I do think there's a couple of different principles that we are worth teasing out. One question is, do they have the attributes of statehood? And we've gone back to that, and I think that's the reference in the book, that there's a people and a region uh, and, and, a, and, and so forth. But the other criteria is, will recognition increase or decrease violence? That's the other criteria, right? Is doing this going to increase or decrease violence? I think there's a case to be made for Somaliland that recognition will decrease violence. It will allow a country to, to uh, become more normalized. The US position, I think most of the international community is, is that they're not going to recognize Somaliland until the Africa Union recognizes Somaliland. They're not going to go against the Africa Union's position because it ain't our business as much as it's their business uh, and, and so on. I'm not sure that's the end of the debate because it leaves the US policy and European policy uh, you know, uh, prevent it, it limits the options because of what the African Union in its own uh, wisdom uh, wishes, uh, wishes to do. Um, but it does also put Somaliland in a kind of a difficult position, we're gonna get deep into the weeds here, but Somaliland was British Somaliland while the rest of Somalia was Italian Somaliland and they actually were two different independence processes and so from a very narrow international legal point of view you could say this is self-determination. The Somalilanders and Somalis merged but now they want a divorce. And can't one party divorce if that party wishes to divorce? Or can the other party say, no, you can't divorce. You must remain part of me. And that is a difficult position, I think, to take uh, internationally. Somaliland's a great story, by the way. It really is a great story. Yeah, Yemen case is similar. Yeah, no, Yemen was independent. And we so reinforced that point. That it did have an international, you, you have postage stamps you know, from these places. Yeah. Sorry, we'll just do a few more right here. Yep, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Donna Fayamati. Um, I've been extensively studying Syria for some time now. Actually, a graduate of George Mason University's SCAR school, so uh, very much so enjoy your comments. Um, my first question is in regard to Syria. Uh, we, we have yet to kind of touch on it. Um, Assistant Secretary, I was wondering if I may pose the question to you. You mentioned um, 
that the United States' position is to support the territorial integrity of states. Um, and President Trump most recently recognized the Golan Heights as um, Israeli. And so I'm wondering uh, how this may spur some kind of new movement of independence or self-determination if it were to become uh, a recognized portion of Israel and how this could create another sort of uh, movement in the region that could per se be a Syrian self-determination movement in that area. Uh, the Financial Times reported that Israel granted the first Golan Heights uh, oil drilling license for a US-based company, so I, I think that's pretty relevant. Um, at the same time, I wanted to pose the question as well, uh, in regards to the recent tension between Syria and Russia, um, as Syria has recognized that Latakia will be given some kind of uh, rights for <coughs> Iran to operate a facility over there. Um, and most recently, um, Russia's aim to return the remains of the Israeli soldier back to Israel also is escalating this tension. And I'm wondering if this new Syrian-Iranian um, cooperation that's more heightened than the Russian-Syrian cooperation may affect the self-determination movement of um, the Kurds within uh, Syria. Um, and then my final, my final kind of point in question is also more geared, geared towards the uh, Syrian Kurds, which is that uh, in the region where Raqqa is, of course, um, the Syrian Democratic Forces have have had uh, some kind of movements, movements of building governance, capacity, so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing an emergence of this uh, new, perhaps, ethnic identity. And when, when you base uh, your governance off of an ethnic identity, oftentimes this can create um, a lot more sort of resentment and um, grievances upon people. And so a lot of Syrian Arabs are afraid of this sort of new identity-based governance that may be uh, along the lines of a Syrian Kurdish movement. And so how might the United States address that and promote a civic, uh, civic ethnic identity for any kind of self-determination movement? Uh, thank you. And we're going to answer those three questions in the next two minutes. Everybody got that? That's all. Why don't we just take those because we have to wrap up. Sure, we do. I just will say that our U.S. priorities in Syria remain unchanged. We're committed to the enduring defeat of ISIS and al-Qaeda. The irreversible political solution to the Syrian conflict in line with United Nations Security Council Resolution 2254 and the removal of Iranian-backed forces in Syria. So even though ter ISIS may have had a territorial defeat, there still is a significant threat, and we will remain until that threat is um, reduced, removed. One, one of the advantages of not being in the US government is you don't have to <laughs> repeat things that are just <laughs> fantasies. Um, Realities. Uh, they're, they're, they're obviously, the war in Syria, it's actually been over for about three years. The fighting continues, but the result is clear. Assad has won on the area and will take over the entire area uh, sooner or later. That is going to be uh, south and west of the Euphrates. Uh, and the SDF, which is essentially a Kurdish-led movement, is for the time being con controlling the area north and east of the Euphrates. Um, will they continue to do it? Well, I was there in December. You know, there was great concern about the, what the U.S. would do, and then a few days later, the Trump tweeted that they were going to get out in, in a month. Well, it's been walked back, and you know, who knows? It's uh, it's it's very uncertain. Uh, uh, will there be some negotiation between them and, and the regime? Will they be a, something like what Iraqi Kurdistan was between '91 and 2003? A great deal depends on what the U.S. and the uh, European powers do. Um, in terms of the administration of northeast Syria, it's actually quite different from Iraqi Kurdistan. Iraqi Kurdistan is, seeks to create a Kurdish state. In, you know, th these people follow the ideology of my fellow Vermonter, Murray Bookchin. Um, I, I kid you not. Uh, and so they talk about having a non-ethnic, completely secular, non you know, a, a, a state uh, that's uh, with strict gender equality. And, so, and, and they've applied a, a lot of that. So the, even before the US got involved, they were keen to include Christians and Arabs. They set up co-prime ministers, man, woman, and you know, one would be a Christian and, and Kurd, and another government, uh, Canton would be an Arab and a, and a Kurd. Um, obviously, 
they've had difficulty in incorporating um, uh, Arabs because they, they are seen as a Kurdish movement. And some of the things that they're doing, which you know, might seem quite sensible to us, for example, the equality of Arabic and Kurdish and Syriac languages, education in Kurdish language is so alien to the Arab culture in Syria that the Arabs see that as offensive, destructive, unacceptable, even though we might think that was a you know, pretty standard uh, human rights. But I, uh, I, there's a kind of political domination because all the, peop you know, the top people, the people who have the guns and the power are, are all Kurds. But from an ideological and, a, and an effort to be more inclusive, that's been there and it really has very little to do with US pressure. It's, it's part of their ideology. There are, incidentally, there is an opposition there who thinks they should just have a Kurdish area. But you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, I'm not going to get into Syria. <laughs> I'm afraid that we are out of time. I am grateful to you all for coming. I hope that you will read Self-Determination Success. Uh, it's on the CSS website, css.org. You can download any chapter you'd like for free. I want to thank uh, Denise and Tally, Pierre Galbraith, Terrence Lyons. I want to thank you for your excellent questions. We look forward to continuing the discussion. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.